and I and, expect and your you, and you questions no, will fully cover and, and everything and, and give me the chance to expound on all of those things. Uh, all right. Well, let's start with um, let's start with this uh, warning to the Israelis about uh, improving humanitarian aid deliveries into Gaza. What can you tell us about this? Uh, a few things. So first, uh, Secretary did write uh, along with his along with Secretary of Defense Austin to uh, the Defense Minister of Israel, Yov Gallant, and the Minister for Strategic Affairs, Ron Dermer, on Sunday uh, to make clear our concerns about the levels of humanitarian assistance that have been making it into Gaza. This was. Uh, a letter we consider to be a private diplomatic communication that we did not intend to make public from our side, but now that it is public, I am happy to confirm it and speak to it to some extent. Uh, I think you have to put this letter in the context of our ongoing and long-lasting communications and concerns about the levels of humanitarian assistance that have made it to Palestinian civilians. If you go back to April, the Secretary wrote at the time to Minister Gallant to make clear that we had seen the levels of humanitarian assistance plateau, and then after they plateaued, start to decline, and made clear that at the time that the levels were unacceptable and that we needed to see Israel implement changes. They did make changes. The changes that they made <coughs> caused humanitarian assistance to increase. Uh, we got up to somewhere between 300 to 400 tr trucks going in on some days to Gaza. but. The thing that the Secretary also made clear at the time is that the increase couldn't be a one-off, that it needed to be sustained. And what we have seen over the past few months is that the level of humanitarian assistance has not been sustained. In fact, it has fallen by over 50 percent from where it was at its peak. So the Secretary, along with Secretary Austin, thought it was appropriate to make clear to the government of Israel that there are changes that they need to make again to see that the level of assistance making it into Gaza comes back up from the very, very low levels that it is at today. And the consequence, if they don't do that, is what? So I'm not going to speak to that today. Uh, obviously, we made clear when we released our report that was mandated under National Security Memorandum 20 that there are provisions under U.S. law that require us to make certain certifications. And to make those certifications, we have to see that Israel is not arbitrarily denying humanitarian assistance making it into Gaza. When the secretary uh, made his conclusions under that report in April, he did so based on the changes that we had seen them put into place and the increased levels of humanitarian assistance. But of course, that those levels of humanitarian assistance have to be sustained. Um, yeah, but, but. <laughs> But what's the, what's the consequence? There are implications under U.S. law, under policy, that I'm not going to speak to here, largely because we hope that Israel makes the changes that the Secretary outlined in the letter. Um, we have seen Israel make changes before, and when they make changes, humanitarian assistance can increase. And we have seen Israel just in the past few months work with humanitarian organizations to implement a polio vaccination campaign inside Gaza. So we know that it's possible to get humanitarian assistance into Gaza. We know it can be done. We know that the various logistical and bureaucratic obstacles can be surmounted. And so it is incumbent upon the government of Israel to surmount those challenges and get assistance in. I mean, you say that there are implications to it. I mean, obviously, under U.S. law, that's, that's assistance. Um, is, there, uh, is there specific assistance that come, that come under scrutiny over this? So I don't want to deal with any hypotheticals. You, you, you are right that it's just, a, it's just a plain reading of U.S. law, if you look at the provisions uh, of U.S. law, that we are required to, to um, uh, conduct assessments and find that recipients of U.S. military assistance do not arbitrarily deny or impede the provisioning of U.S. humanitarian assistance. That's just the law. And we, of course, will follow the law. But our hope is that Israel will make the changes that we have outlined and that we have recommended, and that the result of those changes will be a dramatic increase in, in humanitarian assistance. Ultimately, we are focused on the bottom line here. It's just it. Just humanitarian, I just, humanitarian assistance had been low. The changes that we had recommended had gotten it up, and those, those levels have not been sustained. And so we need to see further changes on, on, by the government of Israel. I mean, obviously, the, the timing of this, um, I, I know you don't explicitly do, do politics, but the, there's an election coming up here. To what extent is that a factor? I mean, 30 days from now would be after the U.S. election. 
Uh, it's been a year since the conflict has been ongoing. Uh, the president has repeatedly warned Israel about uh, about uh, about assistance, about civilian casualties, with uh, at best mixed results. Sometimes uh, this happened in just thirty days before the election. I mean, to what extent was the election a factor? In this? this is not a factor at all. the The bottom line is we felt it was appropriate if we are making clear to to the government of Israel that there are these changes that need to be implemented, that we give them an appropriate period of time to implement, it, implement them. We didn't think it was appropriate to send a letter and just say this has to happen overnight. We give them a, uh, make clear there's a short window in which we want to see change, changes because the humanitarian situation is so dire uh, on the ground. But it is appropriate to give them some time to work through um, uh, the different issues and find ways to get the level of trucks, get the level of food, water, medicine uh, back up to acceptable levels. Yeah, Amir. Hi, Matt. Um, so the 620I Foreign Assistance Act actually doesn't have the word arbitrarily. You say it's the law, but the the NSM 20, which is a memorandum, has the word arbitrarily. So the Foreign Assistance Act says, when it's made known to the president that the government of such country prohibits or otherwise restricts directly or indirectly the transport of delivery of United States humanitarian assistance, it does not have arbitrarily. So given you are already saying humanitarian assistance is very low and putting in front of Israel a bunch of concrete measures on how to improve it, why are you waiting for another 30 days to implement the law? Because we believe it's appropriate to give them a chance to cure the problem. And it, international humanitarian law does make exceptions it, it, for certain, for, I'll give you an example, dual use items is a good example. If there are dual use items that legitimately could use, could be used as a military purpose, uh, of course governments aren't required to let those dual use items in, which is not to say that they can use that exception as a blanket restriction on anything that could be used as a dual use item. For example, if there are military movements happening in a certain uh, period of time, governments can restrict the provision of humanitarian aid during that period because obviously you wouldn't want to put humanitarian workers at jeopardy. So it is, it's not, it, it is not accurate to say that there are, can be no restrictions. It's that those restrictions ultimately can't block civilians from getting the humanitarian access that they need. And that is what we are focused on doing. And so we think it's appropriate. Ultimately, let me just say, ultimately what we want to see here is results. This isn't about making a rhetorical statement. It's not about making any kind of threats. It's about seeing the situation reversed. And so that the, the civilians in Gaza who are not getting adequate access to food and medicine and other humanitarian goods today actually see as a result of our efforts a change in their daily lives. And that's what we're focused on achieving, and that's what we, we are uh, trying to achieve through this letter. Sure, but I guess what I'm trying to get at, and I'll ask you again, is like, we've been at this for over a year now. You have made these warnings dozens of times, if not more, from this podium. Secretary has done it. President of the United States has done it. And yet we're here. Um, other outlets have reported that Reuters has reported all the way back in April that officials from this department have assessed in internal memos that Israel, quote, is persistently and arbitrarily impeding aid in Gaza. So if the law is already being like, I mean, if it's already doing it, why is the United States waiting? So first of all, that is not so we've been over this before, I know, from this podium. There are people that reach that conclusion, and there are people inside this building who reach the opposite conclusion. So I think it's important to state that for the record, that when you have a dip difficult situation, this, it's not uncommon for people to reach different assessments. Uh, ultimately, if you look at the, the last year and our record of, of working to get humanitarian assistance into Gaza, what you've seen is the U.S. intervening at critical moments. Going back to October 12th, let's not forget that um, uh, it wasn't October, it was October 16th. So just a few days after October 7th that the Secretary was negotiating with the Government of Israel until 2 in the morning in Tel Aviv to get the first trucks in to Gaza. I, I know you were there. Um, and over the, next, the, the coming months have intervened on multiple occasions when we thought the levels of assistance getting in weren't sufficient, when there were policies that needed to be changed, when there are new gates that needed to be opened, we have intervened to get that to happen. And you've seen those results. You've seen us go from one crossing being open to four crossings be being open. And that is the result of, of US intervention. Now, 
To answer your question, we have always said that this is an ongoing process, and our assessments are ongoing. They're not static, they're dynamic. And so when the situation changes, our assessments will change and we'll act accordingly. And that's what we're doing. And how did the Israelis respond to this letter? Uh, I, I, they can speak for themselves. I'm not going to speak mean, for them. But I mean, have you received any assurances that they will actually take these concrete measures? Uh, so I'm just not going to speak for them. Those are private diplomatic conversations. They can speak to their And reaction. one final thing. Um, what is your message to the world when they question U.S. credibility in terms of following through? Because President Biden made a similar threat to, to cut off or restrict U.S. military aid in April if Israel carried out a major operation in Rafa, regardless of what you call that operation, Rafa is now like a, a wasteland. And we have seen one shipment of 2,000 pound bombs being withheld, but everything else, uh, billions of dollars worth of you know, weapons have continued. So what do you say to people you know, who question the credibility of U.S. So, in terms of following. So first of all, I will say without getting into all of the details that not all of the premises of that question are accurate um, when it comes to the communications between us and the government of Israel. What I will say is look at our track record of intervening to get humanitarian assistance in and look at the fact that when we have seen levels uh, when we have seen Israel not fall through on the steps that they committed to and when we have seen the results not measure up to the standards that we expect, we have intervened with them to turn those around. And that's what we did in April. And it wasn't just a, a letter from the secretary, it was also the president uh, uh, making this clear directly to the prime minister of Netanyahu that we needed to see changes and that our, po the, our policy would be dependent on the changes that they made. And they made those changes. Now, what we also said is that the changes need to be sustained and the level of humanitarian assistance needed to be sustained. And over time, we've seen the level come down, which is why we are going back in and making clear now that it needs to be reversed. Oh, sorry, one really final thing. You already I, said one more. I have to yes. go, go at, ahead. Okay. At, at the end of that letter, uh, you also talk about uh, establishing a new channel to raise civilian harm incidents, um, which sounds in a way incredible because it's been over a year. So um, can you elaborate a little bit on that effort? What, what kind of a channel you want to establish? And are you saying that, like, Israelis basically ignored the U.S. in all of the previous uh, communications when U.S. raised its concern about civilian harm? Uh, I'm not going to speak to it beyond the language that's in the letter, other than to say that we continue to see Israel not taking sufficient steps to address civilian harm. And you have to look no further um, to understand that than the really horrific results over the weekend. Yeah, Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> Does this building see any inconsistency between sending a sternly worded letter with a 30-day lead time about humanitarian conditions in Gaza to the Israelis while near simultaneously deploying an advanced anti-missile system with 100 U.S. troops to man it? No, of course not. We have What's always, we have always made clear that we are committed to the defense of Israel, and um, that's why you saw the president um, uh, make the decision that he made, which I will let my colleagues at the Pentagon speak to in detail. But we've also made clear that um, there are provisions of U.S. law that we follow, and we will always follow those provisions. And part of that is, is expecting that, the, that uh, the Israeli government fully comply with the requirements under international humanitarian law to make sure that humanitarian assistance gets into Gaza. Sure. I mean, and this is retreading territory that, that Humaira and Matt just raised with you, but I mean, six months ago, it was, it was, there were suspicions that humanitarian law was not being followed by, by Israeli forces. So why six months on if the situation is similarly um, deplorable, do you suspect that situation is meaningful? So changed? you're right. It is a bit of a retread, and I hope All you right. will, I hope you accept my apology for giving the same answer no, <laughs> to the same question. Fine. But, it, but, no, but I, I think it is, it, it is important to be clear that it is because we saw the situation change. That's the, that, I mean, I, I think the premise of the question, the premise of Humera's question is that the situation has been static all along. It hasn't been static. When we intervened back in April to set, to make clear that the level of humanitarian assistance getting in wasn't sufficient, we saw it increase. And we saw that increase sustained for a period of time, but then not long enough, and it came back down. And so we're going to respond to events as they happen. And when um, humanitarian assistance increases and is an acceptable level, 
um, uh, you won't see us raising those concerns. But when we see the situation on the ground that we've seen over the past few months, when we see the level of humanitarian assistance in September, the lowest it has been in any month since the war began, it's appropriate uh, for us to intervene in this way. And to briefly address the flip side, I mean, the Israeli argument is that allowing this aid in provides fuel for Hamas. They, they run a protection racket. They get money. They get funds. They... You know, uh, essentially, they think that taking this step is effectively choking off Hamas. Does the U.S. dispute that that is a reason why the Israelis are limiting this aid? So there are, without a doubt, security concerns inside Gaza um, that make it difficult to deliver aid that has, that has led to the looting of humanitarian assistance in some cases. But the answer to that is not to stop the flow of food and water that civilians depend on and that little babies and children need to survive. That cannot be the answer to that problem. The ultimate answer to that problem is to establish a governing authority in Gaza that can provide safety and security for the Palestinian people of Gaza, that can provide safety and security for the deliver delivery of humanitarian assistance, um, that can provide a long-term political path forward, as we have been making clear for some time. The answer absolutely cannot in any way be penalizing the innocent civilians who depend on this food, water, medicine to live. Okay, I don't want to monopolize time. I have two more. One is, does the U.S. feel that it has clarity? You don't have to specify what it is on the timing and the targets that Israel intends uh, to, to strike in a rhetorical... It's retaliatory strike on Iran. Does the U.S. feel that it has clarity on the timing and targets that the Israelis... We have had uh, a number of conversations with them about that. Those conversations are ongoing, and I'm going to stick with the policy I set out last week, which is I'm not going to speak to those conversations publicly. Okay, and just a, one bigger picture question for clarity. Is it the U.S.'s stance right now that it is calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, but not calling for one in northern Israel and southern Lebanon? We continue... So, a few things. No, we do continue to want a ceasefire in Gaza, but... To be clear what that is, it's not a unilateral ceasefire. We have called for a ceasefire uh, agreement um, that includes the release of hostages. I think you know the, w right. what the details of that. And when it comes to Lebanon, ultimately we want a diplomatic solution, uh, and that policy hasn't changed. But there's no sort of active call for a ceasefire in, in, the, in the same way that there is Correct. in Gaza, accompanied by a hostage. Is that because the U.S. sees that there is a legitimate and achievable military objective on the part of Israel in northern Lebanon in a way that does not exist in Gaza? So we believe that Israel has a right to um, uh, attack and degrade the Hezbollah battalions that continue to be just over the border um, uh, from northern Israel. Uh, but ultimately, we want to see a diplomatic s solution. I would say that the two situations are incredibly different when it comes to um, uh, Lebanon. There's United Nations Security Council Resolution 1701 that we want to see fully implemented. That resolution has requirements for Hezbollah that they have not fulfilled. Um, so it is appropriate for Israel to, to conduct military operations to degrade Hezbollah's capabilities. So maybe they will pull back beyond the Latani River and finally uh, agree to the provisions of 1701 that they have blown through for 18 years now. And that doesn't change what we want to see in Gaza, which is ultimately a ceasefire agreement. But it's a ceasefire agreement that has burdens on Hamas as well, not just on Israel. Can I just follow yeah. up on something that you said um, <clears throat> to my colleagues? Look at our track record when it comes to intervention, uh, intervening when humanitarian aid going into Gaza is too low. Um, but my question is around the timing of this letter. I mean, the World Food Program says that there are no trucks that got into Gaza in the month of October, but September and August weren't great. There were 700 trucks, according to the World Food Program, in August, only 400 aid trucks in September. So why wait till it gets to zero to actually do something? Um, you should not assume that the this letter is our first. Uh, and only conversation with the government of Israel about this problem. We have been having a number of ongoing conversations with them about the very um, serious decrease in the level of humanitarian assistance. Ultimately, um, we did not see the, our concerns sufficiently addressed, which is why the two secretaries sent the letter they did today. Okay. And with regard to... No, um, on Sunday, yeah, I was about to correct myself. They sent the letter that right. is made public today that we right. sent, they sent on Sunday. Okay. Um, and then <clears throat> with regard to action that Israel has to take um, in order to uh, clear this hurdle um, between you guys and make sure that they aren't actually um, uh, not abiding by 
humanitarian law here, do they have to take every single action that was laid out in the letter? Uh, I'm not going to get into days? that level of detail beyond what's in the letter. I think the letter speaks to it pretty clearly. It outlines the steps that we want to see them take. Ultimately, what's important to us is that the people in Gaza get the food, water, medicine, other humanitarian assistance that, um, that they need to survive. Right, but you're not going to measure, you're not going to lay out what that you know, mark of success would look like? I think the letter lays it out pretty clearly, and I'm not going to go that. Well, the letter says, that. to reverse this downward humanitarian trajectory and consistent with its assurances to us, Israel must, starting now, within 30 days, act on the following concrete measures. It says act on the following concrete measures. So should we assume that's all of the following concrete measures? I I'm just not going to speak to it beyond the what's laid out in the letter. So, Sai, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, just a clarification, uh, so I, I can understand it. Why the letter? Just to make it more formal? I mean, as opposed to a phone call showing that this is a very urgent situation? I think I just, just, I think I just yeah, answered that okay, in, well, in response to Kai's question. The, uh, we have not seen sufficient results uh, right. over the past few weeks, um, right. continue to have concerns, which is why they laid out the, the, okay. the changes that we want to see happen in this letter. So, and why the 30 days? I mean, you know, so must the 400,000 Palestinians uh, wait 30 days. I mean, some of them may starve by then. The, the or letter be incinerated, as we have seen. The letter is is quite clear that we want to see changes immediately. And in fact, right. the the secretary sent that letter on Sunday. Um, we did see humanitarian assistance go in through Erez yesterday, mm -hmm. and um, we very much want to see changes. Not wait for 30 days, but happen immediately. Now we recognize that some things, <clears throat> like for example, the the. Um, the letter calls for agreements on what actually would be dual use items. That's not something that can happen overnight. That requires a negotiation. So some things take a little bit longer, but there are changes that we want to see implemented immediately. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, have a couple more on, on Gaza than a couple on the West Bank. But, you know, the Washington Post reported, I think yesterday, about the strike against Al Aqsa Hospital in the middle of Gaza, uh, striking the tents, you know, burning people alive and so on. Now, Israel always says that they're are militant there. We never know whether they were or not, but that is, seems to be a story that is repeated every day. The Gaza people wake up every day to another hundred people dead or something like this. Now, I asked you about this last week, and you said, no, we would never accept this being normalized. But in fact, it is being normalized. It's yeah. not. What happened in that strike was horrifying. Um, we understand the very difficult environment in which Israel operates. Um, uh, but the results of that strike were deeply disturbing. Mm -hmm. We all saw that video and uh, uh, all know that it's horrifying to see people burned to death. And we have made clear our serious concerns about the matter directly to the government of Israel. Mm -hmm. Is it horrifying enough to be considered a war crime? Uh, so I cannot make that kind of assessment from here. As you know, Saeed, right, there's a but, process that we have to go through to assess the facts this, of the law when it comes to the, any individual this, determination. Yeah, but this seems to be going on uh, every day. Day in and day out. And, you know, on the ceasefire uh, talks, uh, Haaretz is reporting that Israel is saying no more talks, no more negotiations. Can you comment on that? So I'm not, I cannot confirm what's reported, uh, I assume, based on anonymous sources. We have continued to engage with the government of Israel um, to try and get a ceasefire over the line. As you have heard us say, that requires not just Israel, but Hamas making difficult decisions. And uh, it continues to be the case that Hamas is not at the bargaining table in any kind of a serious way to talk about how we get an agreement. So you are still saying that if Hamas comes back to the table and they come up with, you know, reasonable whatever, you know, stance and so on, talks will resume? Of course they would. Okay. Uh, we are committed to a ceasefire agreement under the terms that the president laid out on May 31st and that was endorsed by the United Nations Security Council. Absolutely. And now, uh, Israel is going to seize the UN agency headquarters in Jerusalem. Do you have any comment on that and turn it into some sort of a settlement? Yeah, so um, we have made clear that we have, um, uh, uh, that, sorry, we may have made clear for some time that we believe the government of Israel's settlement program to be inconsistent with international uh, law and continue to make that clear to the government of Israel.
West Bank than the one that they're pursuing now, not to mention in Gaza. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. So Israel kills at least, uh, or killed at least 21 uh, civilians in strike on Christian town in North Lebanon. Um, and the, they were like, uh, uh, this place family rented this uh, house so they can escape uh, the horrific time that w where they lived in the south. Uh, is it how Israel defending herself by, by uh, getting an attack in north of Lebanon in a Christian town that there's no existence of Hezbollah militants? Uh, so I can't speak to the circumstances around that particular strike, but obviously the loss of uh, civilian life uh, is extremely troubling, and we've made that clear to the government of Israel. Okay, there was a call between the Secretary Blinken and Speaker of the House, Burry. Hmm. Can you just give us some insight about this call that lasted 40 minutes? Sure, so the Secretary spoke to the Speaker of the Lebanese Parliament as well as to the Prime Minister uh, on Friday to make clear that we want to see a diplomatic resolution to the conflict between Israel and Hezbollah, that we want that diplomatic resolution to include the full implementation of 1701, that we continue to support Lebanese institutions, including the Lebanese Armed Forces, which we see as a bulwark for stability in the country, and that we want to see Lebanon choose a new president, and that it's the Lebanese people and not anyone else that um, that should make that decision. And he urged um, uh, them to move forward with that process, as we have consistently made clear we want to see the government of Lebanon do. Okay, my last question. Uh, so th there was like a warning for, from the U.S. Embassy to the to the American live in Lebanon to live uh, to sorry to leave soon as possible. And it might not be a, f a commercial flight, uh, even the airport. Is that a message that maybe Israel could attack the airport? No, it had nothing to do with that, and it's not. It wasn't a it's question. That it wasn't the a question. The Lebanese uh, people. Just, it, it wasn't a question about commercial flights. It was a question about the flights that we have been providing. So we have been providing these flights that the U.S. government organized for um, nearly two weeks now, and we have seen over the past two weeks. <clears throat> Um, a decrease in the number of American citizens and legal permanent residents and eligible family members who have taken those flights. We've now provided um, 22 of those flights, um, had somewhere around 1,250 people depart on them. And if you remember last week, I think the last time I came here with an update Wednesday or so, 1,100 people have departed. So in the flights that we've had um, since then, only 150 people Friday through the weekend got on these flights. So. We've always said that we would conduct those flights as long as demand um, was there for it. And what we were making clear to American citizens that if you want to get on one of these flights, they may not exist forever if the demand isn't there. So please take one of these flights while they now exist. Um, at the same time, I should note that we have continued to see capacity on uh, Middle East airways flying out of the country. Did you ever get an answer to the question of how much you guys are paying? I did not. Yeah, I did not. I don't know. Behind the ticket. No, 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 not no. for ticket for the cost of the flights. I don't know. Yeah. Can can, can you re, re up that? I will re up that. Obviously, it varies that. based on the the destination, but yeah, I can. Re -up well, that. right, but how many flights did you say there were total? Twenty two. So yeah. Twenty two. No. And look, I, it, it, so we do make we do provide these flights at significant it, cost well, to the U.S. It, government. If the flights are full, obviously the the people on board the flights carry the vast majority, if not all the costs, but you were right that when we have flights that are going out that are only With filled by people. a handful of people, um, it is significant cost for the U.S. taxpayers, which is why we wouldn't continue to con to right. hold them. But in that decision has not been made. It's not been made, but right. it's just we sent that warning today to make clear that we cannot run the flights in perpetuity okay. if no one is if no one is flying on them and there, this is an important and there continues to be sufficient capacity on commercial airlines, which there is today. Tom. Just to go back, you mentioned the video uh, that was you were asked about, you know, people burning in their tents, and you said that we had all seen that. Did the secretary see that video? Uh, yes, he did. And what was his reaction? His reaction was that it was horrifying. Um, on what's happening in the north of Gaza, I mean, the letter talks about this a lot. Um, what is your assessment of both, you know, the, the tactics the Israelis are using and the impact on civilians? So... I don't, I don't, what do you mean in assessment on the tactics there? What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, there's been quite a bit of reporting that the suspicion among Palestinians, for example, is that this is part of the so-called general's plan, that this is, you know, uh, some retired Israeli generals who had proposed uh, the idea of effectively a siege where you yeah. force out uh, civilians and those who are left are effectively treated as militants. And that, the term they used was surrender or starve. Um, is that happening in, in your view? So I can't speak to what the intention of the government of Israel is in conducting these operations. They will have to, to do that. Um, I can make clear that the policy of the United States is that there should be no um, forced relocation of people from Gaza, from northern Gaza, and that there should be no 
permanent occupation of territory in Gaza. And when it comes to the situation in North Gaza, the effect of not just the military operations of the past few weeks, but the, the um, closing of the gates in the north and the restriction on move, of movement of aid from the south to the north, the effect has been uh, extremely, extremely dire for people who live in northern Gaza. Um, when you look at the situation, it's gotten extremely, uh, extremely difficult all across Gaza, but that Im impact has been heightened in northern Gaza. Um, we saw yesterday, for the first time in several weeks, Erez Gate open to get aid directly into the north. We want to see the, the route from Jordan that was up and running for some l number of months that was getting aid coming in directly from Jordan delivered directly to the north. We want to see that reopened and sustained and hope that that, that will be um, uh, that that will happen in the coming days. That's one of the, the policy recommendations you saw that the secretary lay out in the letter. And just to challenge a bit on the point that you said, you know, uh, you were asked repeatedly about <clears throat> the timing of the letter and you said, well, you know, because the situation's changed. But in, in a lot of ways, it hasn't. I mean, you talked about the letter talks about 1.7 million Palestinians in al-Mawasi who you say are at risk of lethal contagion. Um, that has been a situation that has just been building up. I mean, it hasn't you know, uh, it hasn't just happened overnight. And so, I, you know, there will be those who say you've had a year to write this letter to issue such a stark warning to the Israelis. Why is it taking so long? So it hasn't taken. So that, I completely reject the premise of the question, as I think you said. Uh, uh, well, you didn't say, but when you said uh, you're going to push on me, I, I totally reject the, the premise of the question. We have intervened on numerous occasions. It's the what, point I made to Humera's question. In the days right after October 7th. The Secretary was in Israel having very difficult conversations with the Prime Minister about the need to let the first trucks come in across the border. And he was successful and got Rafa opened up for trucks to come across the border. We then had very difficult conversations with Israel about the need to open Karim Shalom. Uh, and those conversations included the President, the Secretary, the National Security Advisor, others across our government. And we saw Karim Shalom open. We saw over the course of months repeated examples of the U.S., not any other country, but the United States intervening and getting results. Now, what we have seen is a significant degradation in the amount of humanitarian assistance that's coming in. The, as I said in response to one of the other questions, shouldn't assume that the letter is our first intervention with the government of Israel about the situation just over the past few months. We have been making it clear to them that we needed to see results, and we haven't seen the results. And that's why we sent the letter that, the sec that we sent on Sunday. Yeah, Alex. I'll Thank you, Matt. <coughs> May I ask you a question? Sure. Um, uh, last week, I asked you about, I'll come to you next for... uh, reports about uh, North Korea sending um, you know, soldiers uh, uh, to fight uh, you know, in Ukraine um, yeah. on the side of Russia. Um, President Zelensky raised his concerns about that, and there are new reports suggesting that they are actually already a few miles uh, uh, next to the soldier, uh, next to the uh, border. And uh, so there's some numbers circulating around 3,000 to 7,000. Do you have any response, any concern? We are concerned by the reports of DPRK soldiers fighting on behalf of Russia. Uh, if that's true, it would mark a significant increase in the relationship between those two countries, the relationship that you have seen uh, develop over the past uh, several months. It would also indicate a new level of desperation by Russia as it continues to suffer significant casualties uh, on the battlefield. The EU has signaled sanctions uh, that they're going to announce tomorrow. Are you guys uh, willing to follow suit? Uh, I don't have anything to preview today, but obviously we have in imposed a number of sanctions and other measures to hold Russia accountable for its behavior, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. I have uh, tomorrow, if on Georgia, if possible. Georgian president today uh, announced her, well, expressed her concerns that uh, the ruling party might rig the elections. The EU also had similar concerns. Is it your concern that uh, you know they might rig the elections, and what are you going to do to, to prevent this from happening? So we want to see there be free and fair elections in Georgia, um, and we'll be closely monitoring in the the days ahead. Thank you. Final final one, right, one me. Azerbaijan has pushed back on you know human rights concerns uh, prior to COP. They said back home we are going to listen to your concerns on, about, uh, prior, prior to COP. They also said that there will be no you know, peace agreement. They don't expect it prior to COP. That's what the secretary was hoping for. Um, what is your response and, and reaction? So we wanted to see, we, didn't, we never tied the agreement to COP. We wanted to see a peace agreement between Armenia and Azerbaijan months ago and have been pushing for uh, a peace agreement and ultimately <coughs> hope to um, get one over the line. But that's up to the two parties, not the United States. Shell. Yeah, thank you, uh, Matt. Uh, on Iran first, uh, news report said that uh, Iran recently conveyed a message to the administration 
through a third country saying that if the Israeli response to the missile attack is limited, Iran will see this round as closed. Can you confirm that? Uh, no, I'm not going to speak to um, private diplomatic conversations, real or imagined. Uh, did you get any guarantees from Israel that they will uh, target uh, only military, not the nuclear or uh, oil targets in Iran? So I'm going to follow the practice I laid out last week and I mentioned earlier in the briefing, which is we're having those conversations with the government of Israel, but I'm not going to speak to them publicly. On, on uh, Lebanon, do you expect uh, Iran's influence in uh, Lebanon to be uh, diminished by weakening Hezbollah? And how do you view uh, the IRGC taking direct control of Hezbollah after the death of uh, Nasrallah? So I don't want to make any forecasts from here, but I, I would note that the influence that Iran has had inside Lebanon for the past years through its support for an armed proxy group has had horrible uh, ramifications for the Lebanese people. And um, it is certainly our hope that Hezbollah's role in Lebanese society and Lebanese government will be diminished because it's the Lebanese people that ought to have a say, ought to have a say in their direction, in the, the future direction of their country, and they should not in any way be held hostage to an armed terrorist organization. And lastly, uh, did the administration ask Israel not to bomb uh, uh, Beirut, and did you give any guarantees in this regard to the, uh, to the Lebanese prime minister? So we have made clear to Israel that we oppose the um, uh, bombing campaign that they had been launching over recent weeks in Beirut. We have seen strikes diminish in recent days, um, and we'll continue to watch it very uh, carefully. Thank Go you. Ahead. Um, on Iran, there's reporting over the past couple of days that the administration has relayed to Iran that any assassination attempt on <coughs> President Trump would be considered a quote-unquote act of war. The NSC put a statement out. I want to see if you had anything on that. And then separately, uh, on the Afghan national accused of plotting a terror attack last week, you said it wasn't clear if he came here on an SIV, even though the DOJ indicated that he had. I wanted to be able to see if you have any more fidelity on Sure. That. On that, so it is my understanding that he did not uh, enter the United States on an SIV, and I'll refer to the Department of Homeland Security to speak to further questions about um, his status. Um, when it comes to the threats against President Trump, uh, as we've said many times, we have been closely tracking the threats against uh, former President Trump and former administration officials for years, dating back to the last administration. We consider this a national uh, security matter of the highest priority. We strongly condemn the brazen threats. And we have made clear that should Iran attack any of our citizens, including those who continue to serve the United States or those who formerly served, that Iran will face severe consequences. Just one follow-up on the Afghan national. The vetting, no matter how he came over, is that done by DHS? Uh, I would defer. I believe that they conduct the, conduct the vetting, but I would really defer you to DHS to speak to it. Um, there are different procedures for different programs, so with respect to this particular one, I would defer to them. They're the lead agency. Sean, go ahead. Uh, could I go back, actually, to uh, what Alex was about North Korea, about something different? Uh, how do you feel about North Korea bombing its own roads? We're just running some <laughs> <laughs> When you put it that way, um, we are monitoring the situation uh, in the DPRK in close coordination with our Republic of Korea allies. We continue to urge the DPRK to reduce tensions and cease any actions that would increase the risk of conflict. And we encourage the DPRK to return to dialogue and diplomacy. So is this uh, a step that raises tensions, uh, bombing Maryland? It Maryland. certainly doesn't do anything to alleviate them. Can I switch to a different topic? Yeah. The, um, Can uh, I put it on up to Sean, if he wants to yield the floor. Uh, if not, I'll come, let me go. I'll come to you next, Danny. Uh, India. Uh, yeah. in, uh, I know you put out the seven yesterday about uh, the Indian uh, inquiry uh, commission having a representative come here. It, it, it was exactly at the same time, basically, that you put this out that, um, that the allegations came in Canada. Uh, do you have any th first? I mean, do you have any general thoughts on India, Canada, round two about what's uh, what's what's taking place? Uh, first of all, I'd say that the timing of those was completely co uh, coincidental. When it comes to the uh, Canadian matter, we have made clear that um, uh, the allegations are extremely seriously serious, and they need to be taken seriously. And we wanted to see the government of India cooperate with Canada in its investigation. Obviously, they have not chosen that path. You say the allegations extremely serious. You mean the, the, the long-standing ones? Canada, yeah. Uh, the long-standing ones. Yes. I mean, yes uh, correct. 
so in terms of how India reacted uh, overnight or how they reacted yesterday to this, how do you feel about that, the withdrawal of, um, I mean, obviously Canada was kicked out, uh, but how do you feel about how India is responding? I don't have any comment on that, but as we've said before, they're serious allegations and we have wanted to see India take them seriously, seriously and cooperate with Canada's investigation if they have chosen uh, an alternate path. The, an alternate well, path, how, yeah, does that, how does that color perceptions of dealing with India? Uh, I don't have any further assessment what, on it. What can you say about the media? So uh, I don't have a readout on the meeting yet. The meeting um, uh, was here as a follow-up on the conversations we have been having with the government of India at the senior most levels uh, over the past several months. Um, they have told us that they are taking the allegations seriously, that the activities contained in the DOJ indictment do not represent government policy. So the meeting that happened this week, or that was happening today by India's inquiry, was um, uh, to discuss their active investigation into the matter, um, for us to update them on our active uh, investigation into the matter, and to continue to share sides about um, steps that could happen in the days and weeks. All right, and I know, I, know, I know you said this, but it's very hard to believe that the timing of your statement was purely coincidental so on I'm, a day when there is massive so I will just events tell, so going on. I fully Indians understand. I will just tell you that we were planning this State, the meeting was planned, and so the statement announcing the meeting was planned early last week, maybe end of the week before, well before we were aware of the actions that Canada was going to take over the past few days. So it is completely coincidental. I promised Janny I would go next, and then I'll, then I'll come to you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, two questions on those Korea. I can see her getting angry as I skipped over her, so I'm <laughs> going to go next. Yeah, I'll that's go. fine. Uh, two questions on North Korea. As you know, North Korea is uh, making an unreasonable uh, claim that South Korea was responsible for the drone's infiltration <laughs> into Pyongyang. And uh, North Korea's Kim Yo-jong claims that South Korea is the main culprit, culprit and that the U.S. should take responsibility. Meanwhile, Russia defended North Korea, saying it violated North Korea's sovereignty and warned against using offensive force. What is the United States position and how can you explain North Korea's escalation of tensions on the Korean Peninsula? Um, so I would refer to the Republic of Korea to speak to the first part of the question. And when it comes to the actions by the DPRK, um, we have seen them continue to take steps that raise tensions, and we will encourage, continue to encourage them to take the opposite path, to reduce tensions and stop any actions that could increase the risk of conflict. Second question, uh, North Korea eventually blew up the inter-Korean road while insisting on the theory of two countries, South and North. How would you comment on this? Uh, I don't have any further comment beyond what I said to, in response to Sean's question on the same topic a minute ago. Yeah, go ahead. On India, what makes you believe at, when you arrived at a conclusion that India is not cooperating with the Canadians on the investigations? So I don't have any further comment on that beyond what the two countries have said publicly. We have urged them to uh, cooperate and will continue to urge them to. to, to they have not received any evidence from the Canadians. And I will defer to those two countries to speak to the relevant status of, um, of the matter. Prime Minister Todo yesterday said that he has shared with the Americans, U.S. government, their evidence of their Indians' involvement. Have you seen those? Uh, what's your thought? Uh, I'm not going to speak pro publicly to pro private conversations. Uh, one more question. The last 24 hours, several Air India flights have received threats, bomb threats, and several of them have been grounded. One of the flights from Mumbai to uh, Chicago was had an emergency landing somewhere in Canada. So, uh, uh, fighter jets were scrambled in Singapore for the flights. This comes after months of threats coming from several citizens in the U.S. that blow up the Air India plane from coming from the U.S. and Canadian, uh, Canadian soil. How do you see that? Uh, obviously Would you be any, taking action against sorry. those individuals who have been threatening for blowing up Air India planes? Uh, so obviously any kind of threats against uh, commercial aviation are inappropriate and matters that are dealt with extremely seriously by our own law enforcement agencies, and I would refer to those law enforcement agencies. Would you take to speak steps that, that such threat doesn't come from the U.S. And uh, again, I will. Um, uh, I think it's a matter for law enforcement agencies, pr uh, predominantly the Department of Justice, to speak to as a first and instance. How these investigations are going to impact India-U.S. relationship? Uh, which investigations? 
the one that has come today. The, the U.S., I didn't know if you were referring to these other questions or to the first one. So look, yeah. India continues to be an incredibly strong partner of the United States. We've worked with them uh, on a number of matters, including uh, our shared vision for a free, open, prosperous Indo-Pacific. Um, and when we have concerns, we have the relation, kind of relationship where we can take those concerns to them and have very frank, candid conversations about those concerns, and that's what we've been doing. And one final question, is India cooperating with the U.S. in, in parts of investigation? So I'm not going to speak to the matter publicly. Um, that's a question that, again, when it comes to the investigation itself, ought to be handled by law enforcement, so I'd refer you to the Department of Justice. Thank you. Just to follow up, I'm, I'm just curious about one thing you said. Um, earlier, we've made clear to Israel that we oppose the bombing campaign over Beirut. Last week, you actually wouldn't characterize the U.S. position on those bombings. So can you explain to us what's changed over so, the course of the last so week? So there are specific strikes that would be, it would be appropriate for Israel to carry out. But when it comes to the scope and nature of the bombing campaign that we saw in Beirut over the past few weeks, uh, it's something that we made clear to the government of Israel we had concerns with and we were opposed to. So if they return to that bombing campaign with an appropriate scope, um, which I assume not, you're not going to I'm define. Not, I'm not going to speak to a hypothetical here. Then we that had, would be fine. We had con So we've had concerns about the nature of that campaign, and we've expressed those privately to the government of Israel. And you said that they have been halted for now, which so you're welcome. We've seen them come down over the past few days, which is not a, a prediction about we'll ha what will happen in the future, but we have seen them come down. Will there be implications for Israel if they don't continue to stay at the levels they're at? I, I just don't want to speak to hypotheticals. But just on that, Matt, um, so are you telling them not to bomb Beirut at all? We have made clear that we are opposed to the campaign, the way we've seen it conducted over the past weeks, few weeks. Now, they do have a right to go after legitimate terrorist targets. Um, <coughs> we see Hezbollah continue to operate across Lebanon, and Israel does have a right to defend itself against uh, those, those terrorists who pose a threat to the state of Israel. But we've had real concerns about the nature of the campaign that we saw roll out uh, across Beirut over the past few weeks, and we made those, those concerns publicly. I'm not going to speak to it in any detail from here, but we have had quite detailed conversations with but the government. Can you Israel. elaborate on that nature? Is it the number of high civilian deaths? Is it them seemingly targeting like civilian infrastructure? It is largely, is it? It is largely the civilian toll. It's the yeah, civilian toll. civilian toll. Go ahead. And I'll come to you next, Ryan. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, George Galloway, former parliamentarian in UK, and Jemima Goldsmith have said that uh, uh, these might be the last few days to save Imran Khan's life, because since last almost 10 days, nobody has met him. Uh, just today, they allowed, according to one political leader, they allowed him. Uh, are you aware of these reports that there are threats to his life and health? Uh, I've seen the reports, and obviously we want to see um, uh, the human rights of uh, every individual in Pakistan be respected. Okay. A couple of days ago, uh, there was a grand jirga in my hometown, Peshawar, by this uh, political party that just recently got banned as well. It's called Pashtun Tahafuz Movement. Uh, basically, it uh, started from the tribal areas where I belong. Uh, Zalmay Khalilzad uh, tweeted about it as well. Thousands of people gathered. Uh, I mean, hundreds of thousands. Uh, one of the demands that they made was that uh, both the Pakistan military and the TTP should leave the tribal, the former tribal areas, which are now part of the Peshawar, where Imran Khan government. So they have given them two months to either leave the area to both of them. Your thoughts on this scenario? Uh, I don't have any comment on that. Ryan, just, one me, last, just, just one last thing, please. Let me move on just because we're running short. Ryan, go ahead. I've got a few more people I want to get to. Ryan. Uh, real quick, Israel, then one non-Israel question. Yeah. You, to follow up on what she was asking, when you say that Israel has a right to strike terrorist targets uh, in Beirut, but have to be concerned <laughs> about the civilian casualties, the entire city is densely populated. Like, what, what is, how could they attack terrorist targets in Beirut without there being civilian I'm casualties? Not gonna, I'm not going to get into prescribing the nature of a military campaign from here. Uh, it is a principle that's true for every country, that they have a right to defend themselves against terrorism. But we've had real concerns about the way we saw the bombing campaign in Beirut uh, roll out over the last I'm few weeks. No, 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 just hold, I, no, just Ryan said he had another question, so before you interrupt. Well, it, it, I mean, maybe to her point, it, it goes to say, 20 years ago when uh, Ariel Sharon uh, attacked a Hamas commander in Gaza. The Bush administration, I'm sure you've seen this quote going around. The Bush administration says, this is outrageous. You know, eight civilians were killed. This is an unacceptable civilian toll. When 
dozens or hundreds of civilians are killed in attacks on Hezbollah leadership, there isn't there isn't even a statement accompanying it saying we regret the civilian toll. Like, what, just, what what changed? No, no, nothing changed. I just made very clear, as I made clear last week, as I made we made clear since the beginning that we were concerned about the loss of civilian life. We're always concerned about the loss of civilian life, and that continues to be the case. Well, the non-Israel question, e yeah. Ecuador. Could could you clarify your statement that you put out a couple days ago about uh, Ra Rafael Correa and Jorge Glass being? Barred from travel, I think the statement said that uh, it was for accepting bribes, including <laughs> including through political contributions, in exchange for granting favorable uh, government contracts. So, can you elaborate on what they're being accused of there? And separately, you know, Jorge Glass was dragged out of the Mexican embassy after being given asylum by Mexico. He's now in a maximum security prison. So, barring him from traveling to the United States doesn't have much you know, functional or practical consequence other than to satisfy Ecuador's side of the argument that they were actually, it was actually okay for them to drag him out of the Mexican embassy. As, as you know, the Mexicans are still furious about that. They're trying to get Ecuador kicked out of the UN for it. Let me take that back and get your response. I admit I'm not uh -huh. uh, fully aware of the underlying details. Heba, go ahead. Yes, but, uh, first, you still see uh, that the Israeli are conducting a limited operation in Lebanon. Uh, so with respect to their, their ground operations in the north, they continue to uh, operate limited incursions, um, and we continue to watch it very closely. Okay. I want to follow up on the question uh, about the airport, because the message that US, uh, the U.S. Embassy in Beirut put out yesterday created like, panic in Lebanon because people are afraid and they are trying to leave. Uh, you said that you... Uh, made it clear to the Israeli that you oppose bombing Beirut. But what about the airport? Did you make it clear we, that? Oh, yeah. We, and I've spoken to that before. I spoke to that previously. We have made clear to the government of Israel that the airport needs to stay open, that we wanted the airport to stay open, that we want the roads to the airport to stay open. The message, uh, I, 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 I hope people didn't misinterpret it, so let me make clear if they did. The message that we sent out was for American citizens and lawful permanent residents and their eligible family members making clear that we may not be able to continue these flights that we have organized in perpetuity. It wasn't about the status of the airport. It was about because we have not seen sufficient demand for those flights. We've had flights, we've had, we've had flights going out with 12 people on them. And so we want to see, um, uh, we want to see people know that these options exist and that they should take them. Moving to the politics, uh, the speaker had a call with Macron, and he made uh, the Lebanese speaker, Nabi yeah. Hari, and uh, uh, I assumed you didn't mean Mike Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> so no, but uh, obviously, uh, when we saw the readout or the leaks in the media, you are not aligned with the French when it comes to the outcome in Lebanon. They are calling for him an immediate ceasefire as per the Lebanese politicians. So are you aligned with them? So we have not called for an immediate ceasefire, but we are aligned in that we want to see uh, ultimately a diplomatic resolution. Is the secretary going to participate in the conference? Uh, I don't have any travel announcements to make today. Go ahead. And then we'll we just talked about the Indian delegation, uh, meetings with the Indian delegation. What kind of message conveyed to them by the State Department regarding the involvement of Indian agents in international crimes? Uh, the same message that we have made clear for some time, which is that it's a matter we take uh, incredibly seriously, and we want to see uh, it fully investigated. So Pakistan is hosting uh, Shanghai Corporation Organization a meeting in Islamabad. More than um, 10 countries are attending. And after 15 years, Indian foreign minister is there and there's an opportunity for the Pak Pakistan-India peace talks. What are your thoughts on that? So the United States respects each country's sovereign right to uh, associate in groupings of its own choosing. We would encourage every country to ensure that its participation in multilateral fora upholds and respects international law and reaffirms the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and independence of all nations. So there are a number of uh, incidents in India in the last few months involving the theft and illegal sale of nuclear materials. Uh, as the United Nations, Pakistani ambassador called um, uh, for the investigation of these incidents. Is this a concern from the U.S.? Uh, so we are aware of Pakistan's request to the uh, U.N. Security Council. We are committed to tracking, developing, developing, and implementing effective policy responses to proliferation threats, and we will continue to work with our partners to shape the international security so environment. One last question. Outgoing, outgoing Russian ambassador issues kind of a warning. He said that America will face a head-on collision with a nuclear power if it allows Ukraine to fire U.S. long range. <laughs> if, if, if it allows what? If it allows what? Oh, Ukraine. Sorry, yes. go ahead. I didn't yes. mean to interrupt. 
So what is your response on his statement? So I, I think it's in, inappropriate for Russia to continue to make these kind of statements, as we've said, for some time. Prem. Thank you, Matt. Um, one of the people the world saw burned alive by the bombing at the Gaza hospital was Shaban al-Dalu, a 19-year-old engineering student who was still attached to an IV drip recovering from a previous bombing. And his story kind of speaks to how this isn't just about one attack. Um, a 19-year-old having to provide for his family, repeatedly displaced, brought to hunger, bombed twice in a matter of days. This is a year, and this isn't out of nowhere. So how many more patients burned alive by U.S. We don't want to see any. Says no, we don't want to see any. Well, I, I guess the U.S. has said, you know, uh, again and again, that no civilian loss is acceptable 10,000 deaths ago, 20,000 deaths ago, and yet it's continued. So how does this answer mean anything without a policy so, shift? So it is an incredibly difficult uh, environment that Israel operates in. And I'll just make clear, the, the, the thing that that question le leaves out as often ha happens, and I understand why, is the burden that Hamas bears. And not just the burden that Hamas bears by hiding behind humans and using hum humans as civilian shields, but the b burden that Hamas bears in not coming back to the table to try to get to a ceasefire. So Israel needs to do more to minimize civilian harm. Hamas needs to stop hiding behind human shields. Both of those things can be true. Both of those things are true. And ultimately, the horrific human toll over the past year is why we continue to push to get to a ceasefire, and why we want to see both sides agree to a ceasefire. If Hamas is an idea as much as a military force, how is continuing to kill tens of thousands of people already suffering from pre-existing apartheid going to defeat that idea? We have always made clear that you cannot defeat an idea through a military campaign. You can defeat Hamas's military wing, you can degrade Hamas's capabilities, but there has to be a political path forward um, for a future in Gaza without Hamas. And we've made that clear um, uh, for the past year. And then just to Humera's question earlier on the U.S. asking Israel for a new channel of communication about civilian harm, how has the U.S. and Israel been discussing civilian harm incidents up to this point, and why hasn't it taken a year and at least 42,000 people killed for the U.S. to consider that its approach for relying on Israel to stop hurting civilians is just we, insufficient. We have long made clear that we want to see changes in their behavior. We haven't seen sufficient changes, and which is why we continue to press them. And with that, we're going to wrap for today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Thank you.